Hey everybody, this is Peter with Tabletop Gaming Guild and we're going to take a look today at another RPG. This one's coming from Free League Publishing and it's called Into the Odd Remastered. Uh, this was originally just Into the Odd and it was written by Chris McDowell. Uh, you know, it came out as a paperback, a print on demand kind of item and it has now been remastered by Chris McDowell again and now graphic design and arted by Johan Noor. And uh, it was successfully kickstarted last year in 2021 and as far as I know now here in August of 2022 uh, all of those items have been shipped out to everybody and we are going to do a quick read through of the PDF that Free League sent us and let's start off with the cover I think this cover is absolutely fantastic I love the 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 kind of the blue and the orange and the pink focus of the coloring it's very unique and different the the marbling of the orange and the blue in this circle around the title is really cool looking and will be uh, when we go to the end pages you'll see a little bit more of that same kind of marbling style this is a game that is all about you being an explorer and an adventurer you and your party and you're searching for treasure um, and magical items that is the crux of this game and the world there's a major city on the surface and there's an underground beneath the world and you're going to be exploring probably the city as well as the underground and there's a little bit of information about the lands surrounding the city of Bastion um, but not much and there is some little mentioning mentioning of other cities out there but everything has pretty much paled in comparison now to this one city uh, where the majority of the game is set as well as again the underground the dungeons beneath it So here's that marbling on the end pages that I spoke about a second ago And we are at the cover page again Free League Publishing has bringing this game out with Bastion Land Press and the Free League Workshop and From the table of contents we can see here that the book is broken up into 12 chapters uh, as well as an introductory adventure and an appendix. So the introductory adventure actually takes up the majority of the book and is broken up into some sections within itself. We're not going to dive into that today because that is for the referee of the game or the games master, whoever that's going to be running it for your game. So we don't want to give any spoilers there. Uh, but it kind of gives them a really good look at how to lay out a game when using Into the Odd and it's very rules light system. Um, but it, it's a lot, like I said, the, the book itself is 152 pages and this is from page 62 to 115. So it's quite a few pages strictly devoted to giving the games master or the referee an idea of what a game in, of Into the Odd could and should probably look like. Um, let's go ahead and keep on going. Our introduction here of An Odd World just talks a little bit more again about the adventurers going for treasure and knowledge and power and that the city of Bastion is the one of the main locations of the game as well as the underground of those sewers and tunnels beneath the city. So that gives you just an idea of the focus of the game. If you're new to RPGs we can see here they're going to give us some very little uh, text explaining what an RPG is and what you need in order to play it. Um, most of us out there who are probably watching this video, you've probably played an RPG or two in your time. Uh, but if not, you, you will find this to be very straightforward and to the point. Uh, for this game, you're just going to need a set of dice that include a 4-sided, 6-sided, 8, 10, 12, and 20-sided dice. Um, and you're going to be needing pencil and paper as well. So it, that is it. It's straightforward. I love this art, by the way. I didn't mention it a second ago, but both of these pieces of art, absolutely gorgeous. The color palettes are great, um, and everything here is really kind of pulling on that oddity. So even here with the stars falling, but like the land, the land there is just kind of almost falling over the waterfall, the same as the water, and that's awesome looking I don't know what this pointed sphere is as well um, but it's very interesting looking and I, I can't wait to see more of the art as we go through the book speaking of which 
Um, so the next part in the book is all about rolling up your characters. Um, and this is, again, like everything else in this game, very rules light, very focused. Uh, you're going to have three abilities, your strength, your dexterity, and your willpower. And to, to create a character, you're going to get three six-sided dice. You're going to roll those three six-sided dice, add those up, and that is your stat for strength. Roll three up again, and that's your stat for dex. Roll three again, and that is your stat for willpower. So it tells you right there that the average of those rolls is going to be 10. Um, and then you're just going to roll up, again, three six-sided dice, and you're going to do it in order. So you roll those first three, strength. Second three, dex. Second, uh, third three, willpower. That's it. Those are your three abilities. And then you're going to take 1d6, roll it, and that's how many hit points you have. Done. You have now basically created your character uh, utilizing your um, utilizing your hit points and your greatest ability. So whether that's your strength, dex, or willpower, whichever one has the highest number, you're going to use those two numbers on this chart here on this page, uh, and you are going to choose for you know you're going to see that, and that's going to tell you what your starting equipment is, your starter package. Uh, so let's say here on here on this chart you have a five health points and you have a 16 in one of your abilities Then you're just going to bring those two things together and it says here that you're going to have a pistol Which is a d6 whenever you utilize it to fight uh, Acid animal repellent and a prosthetic hand There you go. So that's your starter package. Those are your starting equipment in the game um, it says here that you can have companions in the game if you're playing in a smaller party uh, and the idea I think there is that after you've played a little bit you can bring in some companions or you can maybe play two characters at the same time as well but that's it that you've created a character you rolled three six-sided dice three different times created your three uh, ability stats you rolled a six-sided die one time and you got your hit points and then you put those two things together on this chart and you have your starting equipment Done. You have now created a character for Into the Odd. Probably the easiest character creation I've ever had in a game. There is a page here that's going to give you some information about some of the equipment. And again, like I said, each of these uh, weapons, if it's, in a we if it's a weapon, has a, a dice that is associated with it. And that's what you're going to roll if you are attacking with that weapon. So Chapter 3 is all about playing the game. And it talks about saves, taking turns, the actions that you have available to you in the game, how attacks work, um, if there's a weapon that does blast damage, how that works, how damage and critical damage is assigned, and then using an, an Arcanum, which again is one of these magical items. There are a few on this chart here where you put your health and your highest ability skill together some of these starting packages may come with a like kind of a, a a regular arcanum so you could start the game with a kind of a magical item or weapon um but the rules here for playing the game will tell you about how to use them uh and it's just utilizing them is a normal action in the game it's going to get into ability score loss death Deprived, Reaction, Morale, Short Rest, Full Rest, and Bulky. And that is kind of your major stuff here. So playing the game, again, rules light, is one, two, three, four, and that's it. Four pages. Four pages on kind of the major actions and things that are going to happen when playing a game of Into the Odd. Um, the big thing here is when you're playing a role-playing game, you're always going to be rolling some dice eventually, usually. And in this game, it's no different, but it kind of comes up a little bit more rarely. And when it does, it's a little different than maybe some of the other games you've played. In this one, your ability scores are, uh, you want to be rolling at those or below whenever you make a save. So if you're doing something and it requires you to make a strength save, if your strength is a 16, then you're going to roll a 20-sided die and you want to get a 16 or less. As long as you do, you succeed. If you roll above that, you fail. And uh, the game makes sure, makes sure to tell the referee, don't make a player roll unless it's important or there's something that could happen because of the failure. 
And whether you succeed or fail, there should be some sort of outcome. So when you're running the game, you want to make sure that it's uh, a role is kind of imperative. Otherwise, you can kind of let things happen as the conversation takes place between yourself, the referee, and the players as well. Now, the difficulty with these saves can come into the fact that during the game, your ability scores can go down. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. Uh, turns during the game, uh, the players are going to generally have their turn before any uh, enemies or NPCs. The players will go first unless the players uh, might find themselves surprised. It says here that if they would find themselves possibly surprised, they can all make a dexterity save. So they're going to roll that d20 and try to meet or get below their dexterity ability score. Uh, if they fail by going above it, uh, then they will find themselves uh, out of turn on the first round of combat or whatever it is that's about to happen. Um, during an action, the players are allowed to move and perform an action. So movement and an action, and that's it. One move, one action. Movement isn't really defined here because this to me seems to be a game that's probably going to focus on being played in the theater of the mind. So a conversation and this being described from the referee and the players less than miniatures on a gridded map, more than likely. So, so probably theater of the mind. So movement is if I want to get up into melee with somebody or if I want to try to run away from somebody, that would be movement um, as well as then performing an action. So a big thing that will happen in role-playing games is usually there will be some sort of combat and in this game, when you are attacking somebody, whatever weapon it is you're going to attack uh, with uh, is defined by a some-sided die. So usually a six-sided dice or an eight-sided dice, maybe a 10 or even a 12 if it's a bigger weapon. Um, you're going to roll that die when you attack and you will then subtract the armor of the enemy that you're going up against. Whatever that difference is, is how much damage you have done to the enemy. So if you are attacking them and maybe they have two armor and you're attacking them with that pistol that we saw earlier when we were looking through the chart, it said it was a D6, we would roll the D6 and if we would get uh, two or one and their armor is two, then we haven't done any damage. But if we get a three, a four, five, or six, then we subtract the two from their armor and the remainder goes against their hit points. It says here also though that if their hit points were ever to get down to zero, then all the remainder damage that would have happened goes against their strength ability. And that's where you start to see this creeping down of ability scores and we're just talking about strength right now but the other two dexterity and willpower can also creep down and if you eventually get the creature or enemy down to zero strength and their strength ability that's when the creature dies or the player dies so um, you can eventually get your abilities back up to their n uh, regular number but that involves a full rest. And a full rest means that you are resting for at least one full week. It mentions it here on page 19. Uh, one week of downtime. So you cannot be in the midst of any kind of adventure and recover fully. Uh, you can take a short rest, which just says it takes a matter of minutes. Um, you get a swig of water and you keep on going and that will allow you to recover the hit points that you have lost. So again, your hit points are low um, and your ability scores hopefully are a little bit higher. So you might eventually lose all of your hit points and then some of your strength and then take a short rest and get your hit points back, which is going to give you that little bit of a buffer. But once you go through that, if you haven't taken a full rest, then your strength is still lower now and it's going to be harder and harder for you to make your saves because again you want to roll at or below your abilities number and if your abilities number gets lower that saving gets tougher and tougher so eventually you do need to 
turn around from whatever it is you're doing possibly and go back to the city and rest um, or you take the chance of taking some major damage and possibly dying so that is how kind of the combat mechanics of this game works uh, again you're not shooting for a specific number on a d20 they, they don't have an armor class it's just you're rolling against their armor and then you subtract it and that's it so as long as you roll above their their armor number with a d6 then you've hit them and caused damage all in one roll which i think is really really elegant nice and simple um critical damage is listed here as well as part of the game um and then it says here that a character that takes critical damage is unable to take any further action uh, until they have had a short rest or attended to by an ally. And if, for some reason, for some reason, if they've taken critical damage and they're not tended to by an ally, after an hour, they will have died. Um, so yeah, so a lot of different stuff here that's happening um, when people take damage. Uh, also, it does say here that if your uh, damage is rem uh, it does say here that if your hit points get down to zero and you take some remainder damage to your strength, you do need to immediately make a strength save. And if you fail that strength save, then you take critical damage and critical damage here means that if you don't take a short rest or are not tended to by your allies you will possibly die within an hour but as long as your allies are there to help or you can take a short rest then you will be able to recover uh, your hit points so again some information here about uh, death and again if you die it just says make sure that the player character then creates a new character and it's the referee's job to get that character in with the group as quickly as possible and as we talked a little bit ago uh, it's very easy in this game to make a uh, make a character it's gonna be quick and quick and seamless so get that character back into the game or a new character into the game as quickly as possible um, again, other stuff that's mentioned here, we're going to go ahead and skip through this though, but that is the crux of the game with uh, taking your actions, uh, having combat, it's that quick and easy. Now there are a few pages here in chapter 4 that talk about some of the different arcana in the game. These are the items um, that your players are probably going to be searching for or finding as treasure. And at the beginning of the game, if uh, it says if a character starting package contains an arcana, their job is to roll a d66. Simple, it's two d6. You're gonna roll two of them. One of them is gonna be for the tens. So if you roll a one, it's 10, two, 20, three, 30, as such. And the second d6 is going to be the one, two, three, four, five, or six. So if you would roll a two and a six, then that would be 26. And on these pages are listed the arcana that you could possibly roll for that game. And since I just randomly pulled the number 26 out of my head, we're going to jump to 26 and see what it says we would have received. We would have received the Tyrant's Rod, and it says, Order a target to drop, fall, flee, or halt unless they pass a will save. So the creature that you're using this rod against would try to make a will save, and if they would fail, then they would have to do whichever one of these things you had ordered them to do, to drop, fall, flee, or halt. Uh, so that is a kind of a basic arcana, and there is the D66 system to gain those if they're mentioned uh, in your uh, starter package. Beyond that, there are greater arcana here listed as well as legendary arcana and obviously the greater ones have some pretty cool abilities and then the legendary have even greater abilities available to you uh, and we'll just choose one from the page here as well we'll read the star beam panel it says as long as you have line of sight to the sky you can call down a column of light for d20 damage d20 damage is incredibly crazy in this game uh, I don't think any of the regular weapons will do 
anything greater than a D12, and even that is a little bit more rare, but a D20 damage is crazy amounts of damage in this game. I mean, if you, you roll a D6, and that's what gives you your health points. So at most, you're going to have six. D20 damage is insane amount of damage. So that would be one of the legendary arcana, though. Now, I love Chapter 5. Chapter 5 is a quick example of play. It is, I think, five pages long. You can read through it. It, it reads like a play, if you've ever read a play in book form. Uh, and you've got a referee who is playing with a few couple other players. And it kind of goes through a real quick scenario. And you can see here what a quick session of play of Into the Odd could look like. Um, and I think it is very uh, helpful to have this in this PDF in any book, in any role-playing book. I think something like this would be helpful because it gives you as the referee or the player an idea of what it would look like to play this game before you've ever actually played it. Um, obviously, with the era that we're in, you could find a YouTube video maybe where someone has already played the game and they've streamed it or recorded themselves. But barring that, I think it is great that this is in the book, giving you a quick example of what play can look like of Into the Odd Remastered. Again, some fantastic art there. After the expedition, chapter 6, gives you information about where you can go once you have finished a session or a scenario, what it looks like to level characters up in Into the Odd, um, and all of that. And I think it's a really nice, clear system. So it's broken up into uh, six different experience levels, and they are Novice, Professional, Expert, Veteran, Master, and Beyond. And each one of those has a sentence or two explaining what that level is. And so as long as you, at the end of a session, have met your current experience level's goal, then you're going to uh, level up, which is really awesome. So for a novice, you're a brand new character and you're ready to go on an expedition. And then professional, it says beside it, you have survived at least one expedition. So as long as you finish your novice expedition, then you become a professional on your next game. And when you become a professional, you get to do two things. One, you're going to roll a d6 and get that many more health points. So at most at this point, you could maybe have 12 hit points if you've rolled two sixes both times you've gained hit points. After you've gained your d6 of hit points, you're also going to roll a d20 for each of the three ability scores. If what you roll is higher than your current ability score, you can then add one to that ability score. So if you have 12 dexterity and you rolled a d20 and got a 13 or higher, then your dexterity score will now become 13. It goes one higher. And you can do that for each of your abilities. And so you have the possibility of having each of those abilities increase by one when you level up. But again, if you roll at the number or less, then you do not increase that ability by one. So there's the chance that all you're going to get when you level is just more hit points. You're always going to get at least one extra hit point when you level up, but there's the chance that your abilities won't increase at all. Um, I think that's pretty interesting though as well. So you're going to take a look at those experience levels as you finish your expeditions, see if you have met their criteria. If they do, you level up. If you level up, you roll a d6 and get that many more hit points. You roll a d20 for each of your abilities. If you rolled higher than their number, you get to add one to that ability score. Again, incredibly simple mechanics for leveling up your character in this game. Chapter 7 is a chapter that talks a little bit about those of you out there who maybe want to start an enterprise or gather a military force that's going to follow you or do your bidding. We're not going to get into that in this video, but again, you can see here that there's only three pages on that topic. So not a lot of uh, mechanics there, just a little bit of information on how you can possibly put that into your game of Into the Odd if you are interested in doing so. 
Now, chapter eight is all for the referee and about how they are going to um, play the game, how they're going to run the game for the other players. It talks about how the referee, you are the eyes and the ears and the noses of your players. They can't see the world you have envisioned for them unless maybe you have a piece of artwork. Otherwise, it's up to you to describe to them the situations and the locations they find themselves in. Uh, you need to present clear choices for them to make decisions in the game, and you need to show the impact of their choices and their decisions. Um, talks a little bit here about uh, understanding the ability scores, which I think are fairly straightforward, and also uh, the saves that are going to be in the game since it's kind of a major part of the game. It also talks here, though, a little bit about luck rolls, and luck rolls are something that the referee is going to use uh, to determine, uh, determine things if luck is part of the chance of what's happening. So maybe the players are in a dungeon and they're making a lot of noise and you want to find out if they have alerted the, uh, the creatures in the next room. Uh, you're going to make a luck roll and the lower the roll, um, then the worse luck the players will find themselves in. The higher the roll, the better luck. So maybe they, you, roll, you roll a six in secret. That means nobody else has heard them. Even if they've been really, really loud, they're not going to have to worry about uh, bad guys coming around the corner after them at any moment. Uh, but maybe you roll a one, and that means they have been heard, and the giant creature waiting down in the dungeon begins to crawl forth and come after the players. Talks a little bit more about damage and turn length in the game as well, and all of that is more abstract uh, in this game. The actual real time uh, for a turn doesn't matter as much. You know, in turns, characters are going to be moving, they're going to be taking actions, and how much time that takes doesn't really matter as much. It's going to be up to you to determine how that works for your game. Chapter 9 is all about treasure and riches. These are how much, you know, talks about how much money is worth in the game and gives you some ideas about what those different amounts of money could possibly purchase for somebody. A copper penny is the smallest denomination and a gold gilder is the largest denomination with silver standard shillings being right in the middle. Um, and it talks about how, you know, a single gold in this game could buy you a good horse or a wagon. Uh, a few copper uh, pennies could buy you a cheap drink at an inn. And then there's information on discovering the arcana in the game uh, and utilizing them in the game. Talks a little bit about the different sizes of them. Some of them could be lockets, some of them could be giant portals that are stationary. Um, but discovering arcana has a couple of pages here. And then there are a couple of pages on obstacles, tricks, and hazards. Things that you as the referee might be throwing at the players, things that they might come across, and how to, um, as the referee, rule those portions of the game. Um, it's, again, very simple. Tons of white space on this, these pages, just like everything else. Very little text giving you as direct information as it possibly can to help you understand what it is this game is all about. They do give us, this is probably one of the more text heavy pages that we've seen, some sample hazards that your players may run into. And then chapter 11 is the encounters, uh, some of the encounters that the players may run into or how to utilize those encounters uh, as well. Not going to get into all of that. Very straightforward information about how these encounters work um, and some of the creatures. Now, this is where uh, we want to take a little second just to kind of zoom in here on the creatures that they give us as example creatures for the referees. Um, very, very little information. Stat blocks are very small. You get your strength and your dex and your will and your HP for each creature. And then you're given some information about the drive for that creature. What is the thing that, that motivates the creature to do what it is doing? Um, so for example, the dust hag, it says, is driven to protect herself and manipulate others. That's her drive. One sentence, 
when you're running a dust tag, that's her that's her goal. That's her motivation. Um, for thing of glowing smoke that we see up here on page 57, they're driven to guard an arcanum. Perfect. If you are in a session where the players are going to find one of these items, one of these arcanum, then you could throw a thing of glowing smoke in there because its goal is to guard the arcanum. You're also then given a little bit of information about what their actions look like or if they have any kind of immunities to uh, any kind of damage. And then that's pretty much it. Very, very minimal, straightforward information again. Chapter 12 dives into the odd world, uh, talks a little bit about Bastion, which is the hub of mankind, uh, talks about the city and the underground, and then it talks a little bit on the next two pages about beyond Bastion and beyond civilization. So we're not given a, you know, street level map of Bastion. We're just given very little information. There's no maps here. No giant uh, global map or even city map. You're given text description, and then it's up to you, the referee, to build out whatever it is you need your city of Bastion to look like. So they go into a little bit about the deep country around Bastion and other cities, and then very, very little information on beyond the civilization into the, the Golden Lands and the Polar Ocean. These are places that are rumored that could exist, may exist, probably they don't exist, but they do exist. So very little information there if you would like to throw those into your game as well. So we're here at the Iron Coral, which is the introductory adventure, and this takes up about the next like 50 pages of the book itself. So we're gonna quickly just flip through that. I'm not gonna look at anything. I'm just gonna fast forward um, because I don't wanna give anything away because I do though want to show at the end the appendix of the book. And the appendix here is filled with uh, rollable tables. Most of them D20s uh, or other sided, you know, smaller sided dice, uh, D100s possibly as well here it looks like. And these rollable tables are going to help the, the referee flesh out or get some better ideas about uh, the city or other things that the players may have questions for. So I'll just real quick tell you, so we have here a D20 table for borough council decisions. Uh, we have a D6 here for general public reactions to things. If all of a sudden you, something happens and you don't know how the public reacts, roll a D6 and it's gonna tell you there what the public's reaction is. We've got uh, a D100 chart for names in Bastion, and it's gonna give you four names and surnames. You also have a D100 for occupation and capability. You have here manner and connection, another one for events that could possibly happen. Uh, what is this street like? So if they're traveling through the city of Bastion, because it's not fully described here in the book and they want to ask you, well, what is this street like? You can just roll a D100. And if you roll 38, you can say, well, there's a university actually here. There's a university on this street um, and it's a very expensive atmosphere in this area. Um, but you would roll on this D100 chart, giving you some points of interest in the area as well. Uh, also, is there a link to the underground on this city? There's a D100 chart here letting you know if there is or uh, if there is access to the underground from here or not. And if there is, what is it like? You roll the D100, you get a 74. It says here, an overgrown natural cove is he cave is here linking the, uh, the city to the underground. Uh, quickest route across the town, Bastion's greatest businesses, weird creature inspiration, their nature, form, and a possible twist, uh, astral cults, which are mentioned multiple times throughout the book. Here's some information on their collective description, symbol, and standing. And then beyond the darkness, features, hazards, and spoils, What's that island? Some information about creating some islands there. Uh, I eat the stuff. That looks interesting. And is this thing an arcanum? And then there's some really cool alternatives here at the end of the book, besides just those things there for the referee. If your players would decide they do not want to play as humans, 
there are alternatives for those groups and they're here at the end of the book starting on page 136. Uh, you can choose to play as mutants from the other underground and it gives you uh, information on how to create those characters and how to advance them in the game. Uh, maybe you choose to play just as simple country folk. You're not from the city. There's a way to roll up those characters as well. The unhumans, these are the uh, the alternate character options for of humans. You could end up being stocky, bearded people, dwarves. Uh, you could be small and pudgy and hide in tiny places, halflings. You could be a slender, unaging immortal, elves. So there are ways to play those types of creatures in the game, but the idea here, if you're using an unhuman, is they want you to roll a d20 for the group, and then everybody's going to be the same type of creature or unhuman. So those are your options for playing unhumans. And then there are unhuman starter packages, and what do the humans think of your people charts here as well. And then we finish with a page on the back here that says before rolling their character, any player can declare that they are using this table in place of the standard starter package table. And you would do the exact same thing as the regular one. It's your HP and your highest ability. And then you put those two things together and that gives you a starter package. And then we have a quick little index here at the end of the book. And we're done. We have wrapped up our read-through of Into the Odd Remastered. It is a very interesting rules-light game by Chris McDowell with the art by Johan Noor. So I think Into the Odd has some really great potential to be a fun fantasy game. Um, I love that it's rules-light. The mechanics are very easy and simple to follow. The onus, as usual for most role-playing games, is going to be on the referee to come up with what is the scenario that's happening, to really sketch out the adventure ahead of time for the players, and then to lead them through their descriptions and the players making their decisions. But the big thing to remember about Into the Odd is that it is a game that is all about finding treasure, gaining knowledge, gaining power, in this very strange and odd world. Um, I think it's gonna be a fun game to play. I think it's gonna be interesting to introduce it to my friends. When they see how easy it is to make a character in this game, they're going to love it. Um, so yeah, I'm super glad that Free League sent us a copy, a PDF of this game. I'm looking forward to eventually getting my hands on a hardcover so I can see and feel the book itself because uh, I love the look of it. And as everything that Free League puts out, the, the quality of their physical products is outstanding. So I can't wait to see this book in person. Uh, but everybody, thank you for watching. I hope this video helped you to understand what Into the Odd is as a game and whether it would be interesting for you to have it on your shelf or play it with your friends. I hope you liked the video. Uh, if you did, give it a like and subscribe to the channel and check out all the other great videos that we're doing here with Tabletop Gaming Guild. And until we talk again, everybody, keep on playing games.